A Hole Productions. Behold the Source Wall. Behind it is the single greatest secret of the universe. This is as far as I dare to go. I have my friend Gene Hoyle, who's joining us on the show to complete and expand our Green Lantern coreness, so I'm not just a sole Green Lantern member. I have Gene here because Green Lantern is one of our favorite characters. One of the reasons that Gene and I met each other was over our love for Green Lantern and, and how kind of I popped up on his radar and we became friends. And uh, and yeah, I'm, so I'm very excited to have him to, uh, here today. So Gene, thanks for being here and say hello to everybody. Hey guys, um, I'm a huge fan of, of the core. And Hal specifically, although I love almost every member I, I've read, um, it, it's been a big part of my life for a long time. I was I'm a little bit older than Zeke, so I was reading Green Lantern new right around issues like 160, 170, um, up till you know up past that. And so it was a good time to be a Green Lantern fan. Going just a little a couple of years before the crisis is when I started reading it monthly. That's awesome, and that's really great core stuff in that run too, uh, specifically. <laughs> Well, yeah, and they were doing some great backup stories at that point. Like, around issue 160, they started doing Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, and you got some of, like, the famous Alan Moore stories in there, as well as some other great talent. Absolutely, and so that's what we're here to talk about today. This week, we've kind of celebrated, or DC celebrated, much like they have all year, with 80th anniversaries of a bunch of different characters. We've had Wonder Woman, Flash, um, or Flash may have been 75th, I can't remember, Um, but then there was also Robin, uh, Joker, and now Green Lantern, and so they released, uh, with all those characters, giant 100-page super spectacular issues that are $9.99, and luckily Gene and I were able to get our hands on a copy each, and you had... Because there's different covers from different eras. So you had the main cover, right? The Ivan Reyes one, I think? Yes, yes. I had a, a number of core members on it. Okay, yeah. And I, of course, me, I had to have the Jim Lee cover. All these issues, I have the Jim Lee cover. Uh, so it's a great shot of Hal flying with two uh, fighter jets behind him. Nice. I will say, in general, that these um, these giant books that they've been doing have been really, really good. Um, they, they try to get people from various eras of the books that they're doing tell stories from that period and I think it's been really successful and some of the best stuff DC's put out yeah I agree um, actually this is some of the best stuff that DC's put out this year and I'm loving every single bit of it I mean they're, they're they've been killing it and uh, I love the uh, you know the the different voices that they have on these you know they have someone coming in giving their take on Wonder Woman and their take on Robin and you get you know in the Robin book every story was a different Robin and that's what we get here with Green Lantern since there's so many Green Lanterns we actually get pretty much a story from all the major Green Lanterns that uh, you know of Earth and stuff which is and a couple Lanterns that aren't green and uh, and aren't from Earth so yeah this was fun so overall did you really like this issue like I did a ton it's probably the the Green Lantern story I've enjoyed most in the last like five or ten years yeah absolutely I mean obviously you and I being big Green Lantern fans from you know childhood and teenage years and growing into Green Lantern once he became cool when Jeff Johns wrote him that's really when the character hit like a superstar status that he's never had in comics before and that was a a great time for you and I as fans because we're like hey great finally other people can read and learn about this character and we can talk about him so yeah since then you and I have kind of fallen in and out of Green Lantern stuff so it was nice to have this to kind of you know be a uh, a beacon of light really to bring us both back to the character well sure and and, and again like you said he kind of became a mainstream hit which was fantastic because that was almost never the case before um, I think he did almost what Greg Pak did for Hulk uh, with the World War Hulk stuff and it just really told a solid story that people wanted to read Absolutely. And yeah, it led to a movie, it led to a roller coaster, all these things that we didn't have before, a bunch of toys. So yeah, it was a good time. And they also added the emotional spectrum and other lanterns, which is uh, really great as well. So um, so let's dive into this book, man. Let's not waste any more time. Uh, we actually start off with the original Green Lantern, uh, but a kind of a new origin in a way for him. Not too new if you grew up, uh, you know, the past couple years reading comics from New 52 onward. Uh, you probably know Alan Scott as a gay character in Earth 2, but this is now the new continuity of Alan Scott in the main DC universe, and they've decided to take that part of his character and add it to the part that was already existing in the original Alan Scott, and they told this really great story by James Tinian IV as the writer and Gary Frank as the artist. Uh, This story is called Dark Things Cannot Stand the Light. 
Gene, how, you know, what was your thoughts reading this story? First off, I was absolutely fantastically happy to have the the original Alan Scott back because he's always been a big favorite of mine, um, especially in that big dumb costume. I love that <laughs> costume. It, it's the most hideous thing since Daredevil's original costume, um, but I love it. I really do, and it's nice to see this Alan Scott back. And I like that they've added to the character by you know taking some stuff from the New Fifty Two. Uh, making him a gay man, which I know there's been some complaints online about it, and I don't care, because I think it's a good development. It, it adds to the character. I don't think it takes away much at all. Um, and we still have the basics of Alan's origin here. Uh, he's on the train. There's the crash. He's studying hard water. And, you know, it's it's pretty much spot on from what we've had before with that small change. Yeah, in fact, it's so drenched in continuity in just these few pages that they even have Derby in it as his cab driver, who was one of his original cab driver back in the 40s. Um, yeah, yeah. That, was a, that was a neat thing. That brought a smile on my face. <laughs> yeah, so like they, they, sh- they literally show, hey, look, we're not changing really anything about the character, but we are kind of adding in an element where, because people forget, like uh, a lot of fan New 52 brought in a lot of fans to DC Comics because Marvel was outselling them left and right with the success of their movies and everything. And for years, Marvel was crushing it. And New 52 was the first time DC in a long time that they took over monthly sales and, uh, you know, for, you know, consistently. And so you have to consider that, like that a lot of people knew Alan Scott in the Earth 2 iteration. So what I like about like what you said, they don't by adding that they haven't taken anything away because I saw some people saying like oh but Alan Scott in the main universe he has two kids um, you know and, and that you know they grow up to be superheroes and villains of, of their own right and I said yeah but nothing in the story prevents that from happening you know like uh, it's not like Iceman where they were like hey let's bring him from the past as a teenager and just say he's gay now which undoes pretty much all the times Iceman hooked up with women in his continuity Whereas if you had it to where Iceman reve- learns later on in life that he might be gay, that's a better way to handle that revelation. And that's kind of what they do here. Alan Scott admits that he's running away from himself, which you could could mean that maybe he does have a family out there with two kids and this was him running away from that and that's how he met this young man on the train that he kind of started to grow feelings for. Or... It, like I said, the, the you know, uh, what is it, uh, Jade and Obsidian? Are those his kids? Uh, yes. They'll, or they'll come, they'll still pop up in continuity in a different iteration as either adopted kids or whatever. But to me, it uh, it doesn't really take away from the character. And I thought what James Tinian did is he didn't hit you over the head with it. He, he kind of had this thing, this message about how Alan didn't feel like his real self. And he's talking to the mom of the young man he, you know, connected with on the train before the train got blown up and the kid died. And he's going to see the mom and telling her, hey, I got justice for your son. And I felt the same way your son did. And she, without just coming out and saying it, she says, yeah, my son used to talk about having a fire inside of him that he didn't know how to deal with. And that fire comes out in a physical form in Alan when he decides to transform into Green Lantern in front of her. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, and also, if I remember right, um, it's pretty close to the Earth 2 origin. Um, I'm pretty sure they did almost the exact same thing with, you know, going back to the train in the hard water from the original comics mm-hmm. and bringing it into where, you know, there, there's a guy involved. And um, Alan Scott's feelings about being a gay man at that period in time, because right now it's not great to be a gay man in society, but at least you have a chance to live a, a decent life without being harassed too much. In the 40s, being a gay man was almost a death sentence. Yeah, it really was. Um, and like you said, there are still instances where that could be a thing now, but it's so far and few between. I wish it was non-existent, but it's it's obviously way less now than it was back then. And yeah, it was. And, and that's something they touch on in the Doom Patrol TV show and other shows that are set in those time periods. So yeah, I like that they addressed it here. And they, like I said, Alan Scott does not act any different than the Alan Scott I grew up reading by adding this to him, and that's why I think it was very well done. I think it was fantastic, and again, the story got me really excited. I'm, I'm wondering, DC really needs to, to be more clear as to where their continuity stands right now, because bringing this Alan back made me so happy, and it opens up the possibility, okay, the JSA exists in the 40s again, that's awesome. All these characters can exist again, and yes, we can get Jade and Obsidian again, 
because Alan didn't have him until much later in life. They, they weren't like, he wasn't a teenager when he started having kids. Right, right. And he's not a teenager in this particular story either, so... Um, so, yeah. But, I mean, he was, he was way more of an adult when he had started having kids. And if I remember right, the kids were Harlequins. Not Harley Quinn, right. but Harlequin, right. a villain from the, um, that period in time. Right, that's right, yep. Um, and then they grew into greater importance, especially during Brightest Day. Uh, Obsidian and Jade had a big part to play as well in that story. Um, yeah, Obsidian was also a fairly decent regular character in um, Mark and Draco's Manhunter run. That's right. Oh, yeah, shout out to Mark and Draco, yep. a friend of ours. Um, yeah. So going from the Alan Scott story, which you know I I agree with you a hundred percent on that story. Um, what did you think about the second story, which was about how Jordan, written by Jeff Johns and drawn by Ivan Reyes, it's called Last Will. I gotta tell you. Just reading it fresh, without really getting too much into my thoughts, I enjoyed the story very much. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I could probably spend a half hour picking at it, and I think we did that earlier today on the phone. Hmm. But um, at the end of the day, it was a fun story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, without getting into the story yet, because I'll let you, you know, take us away in, into that territory. But um, yeah, like looking at this story the way it is. It is if you if you if you take off if you, you got to turn off the fanboy part of your brain a little bit and you just got to realize okay, this is Jeff Johns who pretty much said everything he's ever wanted to say with the character of Green Lantern and ended it in a way that was very good at the end of his run. Um, it's like okay now I'm going to come back and write a Green Lantern story. What do I do? And I kind of like the approach he took. So yeah, as a as a overall concept and execution, I do think it's very well done. But if you did have some uh, nitpicks what would some of those be? And then we can also get into what the actual story was if you want to start there. Sure. Well, let, let's give the basics on the story. Hal um, is, is flying in space. Something happens, and he, he crash lands on a planet. Uh, the ring informs him that it's, it's almost dead, uh, and it has probably enough to, uh, juice left in it to send through messages. But then that's it. That he's, done, he's on, this, on this seemingly foreign land uh, in the middle of nowhere on some planet, and he's probably going to die there. Um, so now sends messages to three people. Well, it's actually, I guess, more like 7,202 people. But because uh, he, the first people he chooses choose to send a message to is the entire Green Lantern Corps. Right. Um, followed, followed by um, uh, Batman and then Carol Ferris. Um, I'm not certain about the Batman thing. We talked about that earlier, too. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we can we can start there. Well, how, how does the story end, though? Like, so Batman, I mean, Green Lantern has... He has, basically his ring says, we have enough juice to send three distress calls. Who do you want to send them to? And he says, well, I don't want to send distress calls at all. I'm going to send them just final messages, like a last will, to three different groups of people. So he starts with Green Lantern Corps, then he sends one to Batman, then he sends one to Carol. Uh, but what happens to him um, once his power ring dies? <laughs> once his ring dies, he decides to get up and kind of walk around um, for whatever reason. He gets up, he, he walks over a hill. Turns out he's on Earth in Las Vegas. <laughs> in the, you were the reason, it, yeah, go ahead. It, it, it's so funny when he realizes this, and his one thought is like, "Man, they're going to make so much fun of me." <laughs> yeah. So the reason he, because you said, "Oh, he gets up for whatever reason." Yeah. It, basically, he thinks he's going to run out of breath because he's like, "Oh, I'm on an alien planet. When my ring dies, I'm going to have no oxygen." And then his ring dies, and he's like, "Oh my god, I can't breathe!" And he stops and goes, "Wait, I can breathe." So he stands back up. He's like, how can I breathe on this planet? And he goes over the next hill. And like you said, he's staring at Las Vegas and he realizes, oh, crap, I crash landed on Earth. <laughs> and uh, he says, ring, can you pull back all those messages? And the ring was like, uh, you know, it's dead, so it can't answer him. So then the final shot is basically Hal sitting at the table with his arms crossed and all the Just League members making fun of him. <laughs> so, so good. It is. It, as, if, as far as executing the, the, the joke and the humor, and like I said, it's like, imagine you wrote this great run on Green Lantern and you said everything you wanted to say. Imagine getting the call saying, hey, can you come back for one more story? What do you do? And I think Jeff chose the right choice here by doing this. But even in saying that, you and I had a few, knowing that we're, you know, we love how Jordan were big fans of his, we had a few nitpicks. So what were some of yours for this story? Well, the big one, and I think you brought this up too. I keep referring to a phone call that no one's listening to, so I'm not sure why I keep doing that. <laughs> but... um he, he contacted Batman instead of Ollie. That bothered me on a fundamental level. That's his best friend. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I think he should have called Oliver Queen instead of Batman. I agree. Yeah, that, that's a big thing. Um, also, how giving up. 
right away and saying, well, I'm screwed. I'm going to die. That's it. And then, like, I'm going to send some goodbyes out. It doesn't seem like Hal to me. Um, Hal would never give up until he was full, like, no more air in his lungs, in my opinion. Right. Um, yeah, and speaking on the Batman thing, the main reason I thought he should have called Ollie instead was because there's literally a line he says to Batman where he said, if it wasn't for you, I'd probably be dead or worse. I'd probably still be Parallax. And I'm like, well, uh, Batman wasn't the one who shut Parallax down. <laughs> Oliver Queen was. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's why when I was reading this, I was like, I wonder if maybe it was originally supposed to be Oliver and for some reason behind the scenes they wanted to make it Batman so they can get Batman in this issue somewhere. I mean, I, I guess that could make sense from an editing standpoint, but for me and you, I think we agree it should have been Oliver Queen. Um, and, right. and also, yeah, Hal does not give up. It, he's he's a very tough guy to just go, uh, all right, uh, the stakes are against me, so screw it. I'm giving up and sending out my last distress call. Um, I guess you could say this is a, a matureness in, uh, in Hal in this storyline because we don't know when it takes place. So it could be just right. more of him maturing and not being the rash young man that he is. But I feel like no matter what, kind of like Han Solo, Hal's always going to be a rash young man. Yeah, I think so too. Um and the other thing is, is Batman, in the context of um, Rebirth, you know, Green Lantern Rebirth, when it first happened, yeah. um, not only did Batman not help that much, he was a hindrance at times, to the point where John Stewart had to be like, backup dude. Yeah, to the point where how Jordan punched him in the face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was just a jerk in that book. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I almost, I thought for a long time that uh, that John that Jeff Johns didn't like Batman, actually. Yeah. Um, but then he reconciled that with issue nine. I think it was uh, Green Lantern and Batman teamed up to fight the Tattoo Man. Um, yes. And he reconciled his feelings for Batman at that point. So I was like, okay, Jeff does like Batman. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for Batman and Green Lantern not to have got along because Batman relies on fear to stop people, uh, to scare them. And Hal Jordan doesn't believe in fear. So it, it, it's kind of like he sees Batman as like, oh, he's not so bad. He's just trying to scare people. That doesn't work with me. That's true. No, it's, you got a great point. And, uh, and actually, you bring up a good segue, too, because you mentioned fear, so we might as well talk about the next storyline, which is written by Colin Bunn, by art by Doug Monkey. It's called The Meaning of Fear, and it stars a, a very controversial Green Lantern and also the leader of the Sinestro Corps War, Sinestro himself, Thal Sinestro. Yeah, you can't really tell too many Green Lantern stories without at least mentioning Sinestro, so I'm very glad he did get a story in this. Uh, and it sure is neat. Um, I was actually surprised at the way it ended, which I shouldn't have been because, you know, Sinestro is a nasty character. <laughs> and he does some nasty stuff in this story that I enjoyed. Uh, but it's a neat look at the character of Sinestro. Yes, he, he's basically like Sinestro always does in the hands of a good writer. He um, He's trying to justify his purpose. And, uh, and so his thing in this one is that he runs across a Green Lantern who is at like 10% battery life, much like Hal was in the previous story that we just talked about. And this Green Lantern, um, you know, Sinestro shows up and says, do you know who I am? And the guy's like, yeah, you're a terrorist. And, uh, and, and you know, Sinestro's like, yeah, I like that word. That's actually a good word. <laughs> He's like, I, I am a terrorist. And so he kind of embraces who he is, but he goes, but let me tell you why uh, I'm okay with that saying. He goes, because I believe in fear and I believe without fear, how do you motivate your willpower to get you to do anything? He's like, so I am afraid of the things I love being taken away from me. And I use that fear and combine it with my willpower to, to bring justice to the galaxy. And he, so he's trying to convert this Green Lantern who is moments from death because his power ring is dying. And he's like, you know, just, just give in to me. I'll give you a lantern ring or I'll give you a Sinestro core ring and you can join me and we can combine your fear with your willpower and we can go around bringing true justice to this galaxy. And what happens to this guy? <laughs> well, he declines the, 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 the polite invitation by Sinestro <laughs> and a hole blow, blown through his head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Sinestro, he off, Sinestro offers him that choice, saves his life first and then offers it to him. And, uh, and the guy says, no, I'm not doing it. I don't, I don't stand with fear. And so Sinestro's like, that's a pity. And he blows his brains out. <laughs> um, but there's a cool moment at the very end. Do you remember what happens after he kills the guy? I'm sorry, say that again? I said, I'm sorry, there's a cool moment that happens at the end, right at the very end after he kills the guy. Do you remember what happens? You know, off the top of my head, I don't. It's uh, the power ring itself uh, flies up to Sinestro, and it's like, uh, you know, Sinestro says you know, I did you a favor ring because the ring was trying to decide 
do I sit and die with this Green Lantern, or do I go try to find a replacement Green Lantern and just abandon right. abandon him? So Sinestro makes the choice for the ring by killing the guy, and he says, good, now you can go use your last 10% and find a replacement. And he goes, I did you a favor, ring. And then he follows the ring to see who it bonds with so he can make them the same offer. <laughs> right. Um, interestingly about Sinestro is he spends a lot of tra- time trying to convince people, like, hey, I'm not the bad guy here. Right. I'm trying to do this. If you all just listen to me all the time, the universe will be a better place. And he truly believes that. Yeah, no, that's the thing. That's what makes him such a great villain is that he he cannot see his actions as being wrong. And again, like I said, Colin Bunn wrote a Sinestro series for a while there during New 52. So it was kind of cool to see him come back here. And he was consistent with what I know as Sinestro to be, which is a guy who, like you said, he sits around and tries to justify his actions so that he he tries to convince you that he's not the villain. Um, And that's kind of what he does best. And he he usually provides really good arguments. (laughs) That's the scary thing. Well, that's the thing. I, I think I would compare Sinestro a lot to, if you guys are Star Trek fans, the uh, Cardassians in Deep Space Nine, um, because they're they're monsters, they're horrible. They they took over an entire planet um, in very much kind of a, a metaphor for for what the Germans did in World War II with taking over France and different places. Um, but they completely thought they were justified and even doing a favor for these people that they were in control of, and that's very much Nestor to me. Absolutely, and yeah, there's nothing worse than and anything in the galaxy than a Kardashian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, now going on to the next story, which is something that is definitely not my original era of when I came into Green Lantern, but it is a definitive era for the character and one that I read later in life, which is the Green Lantern Green Arrow Time Alone storyline that was written here by the great late great Denny O'Neill, who just recently passed away, and this is his last published work for DC and reuniting with artist Mike Grell from Longbow Hunters. Dude, how was, how amazing was, this is probably me and you, one of our favorite stories in this book. What did, tell me your thoughts. How much did you love this story? I love this story a bunch. First of all, it was very fitting that Denny's story, his last story is, is one that I think it was the most important work he ever did. It was the Green Lantern and Green Arrow run. Mm-hmm. Now, um, when I first read Green Lantern, I mentioned earlier that around issue 260, I started reading it monthly. However, my first encounter with Green Lantern were some of those later um, Danny O'Neill issues with Green Lantern and Green Arrow. Um, so that those two as a team always interested me. And then seeing Green Arrow over in World's Finest and stuff, and I got a real connection to the DCU at that point. But, um, th- I mean, this team is just the Green Lantern team. It's as simple as that to me. Uh, I'll always, when I think of Green Lantern teams, these are the guys I think of every time. And it's such an honor to, to read Denny's last story and have it be so good, so good, just really good. I mean, I agree. Yeah, the story, it kind of starts off, and you have the, is it the Clock King, who's kidnapped this young girl, and he stole this money, and he's like, yeah, I planned everything exactly how I need to, so I can jump off this platform, land on a train, and that train's going to take me to safety. Green Arrow is trying to stop him, but of course the young girl that he's holding, she like squirms to try to get free, and that throws off Clock King's timing, so when he jumps to the platform, he drops the young girl, and she's almost going to die, but luckily Green Lantern shows up to help. So starting off the story that way, did you kind of like and enjoy the campiness of it, and then how how did the curveball come, the fact that it starts off campy, but it ends way more somber? I liked it a lot, and one of the things I really enjoyed about it was Clock King. Um, yes, he was trying to rob a train. Yes, he was up to no good. But he seemed to genuinely be concerned for this girl's welfare. He didn't want her to get hurt. Um, it seemed to me, at least, in reading the story, yeah. that he, he, was, he was kind of genuinely not a terrible guy. I mean, he was, he was robbing a place and using her as a hostage, but he didn't want any harm to come with her. He wasn't a callous killer, uh, and I liked that. Even though, you know, Green Arrow doesn't care and he beats the crap out of him. <laughs> yeah. No, he's beg- begging for his life and Green Green Arrow is, uh, Ollie does not hold up. He, it's actually pretty brutal and they, and it's for a purpose. Like it, it actually serves a purpose of the story that he's that brutal and right before he's about to throw the last punch, which probably would have knocked Clock King's teeth out and broke his jaw, um, that's when Green Lantern uh, projects a baseball mitt to catch his punch. 
<laughs> which I thought was really awesome. And uh, and then so from there, you know, they go into a story where Green Lantern says like, "Hey man, you're you're going too far." And Green Arrow is like, "How dare you tell me that?" Is how you've been gone for two two months. And how's like specifically you know responds, "No, two months and two days." And there's a reason. And uh, what was that reason, Gene? Do you remember? Um, basically, Hal has been turned on by Black Canary to a book, um, and I cannot remember exactly what book it was off the top of my head. But um, it, it's a philosophical thing, and he wanted to go and recreate the experience that the writer had when making the book. Because it took him what two years, two months, and two days, or something. Um, so Hal wanted to go and experience that book. So he actually took it, went off of the space for that time and isolated himself so he could really absorb the meaning of this book. And it really affected um, Hal's thought on the violence that they perform during, you know, being superheroes and stuff, and how maybe they don't need to all the time. Yeah, the book, by the way, is a book I've, uh, that, you know, I'm a big Henry David Thoreau fan, and uh, and I read a lot of his stuff in high school. The book is called Walden um, in the Life uh, Life in the Woods. And, uh, and yeah, I think uh, Henry David Thoreau had disappeared from the world for i think two years two months and two days to kind of go on this i guess you know introspective journey that led him to the the creation of this book and so how you know decided to follow in those footsteps and read this book and go on to a random planet for two months and two days and yeah he kind of he says this helped me understand the brutality that sometimes we get caught up in when we deal with people who are villains and how we can sometimes go too far and how we need to pull it in and be more heroic. And so, yeah, he passes that book on to, to Green Arrow. And I don't know if you, if you just mentioned it just now, but where does Green Arrow go to disappear for two months and two days to read the book? I didn't mention it. This is one of my favorite parts. Um, um, Clark Kent allows um, Ollie to hang out in the Fortress of Solitude for a few months to, to absorb this book. Um, and, and have his isolation. And I thought that was terrific. I love that they brought Superman into that for a second in a mention. Yeah, he was like, hey, I talked to Superman, and he said it was fine that you use this place for the time being. So you have two months and two days. Here's the book, and uh, you know, and I'll, I'll come back and pick you up in two months and two days. And I thought that was great. And that it even ends with the one of the, my favorite quotes from Henry David Thoreau that stuck with me for years, um, which is, things do not change we change um and i love that so much i love that so much because yes life is a hamster wheel and it is up to us to decide when to step off and uh, and i love that so much oh man it was so good so yeah i couldn't think of a better message really to uh to say goodbye to denny o'neill on than something this impactful with these two characters exactly And and that was the thing with the original run of Green Lantern and Green Arrow, uh, Hal ends up on an introspective journey of his life because of things he's realizing. He's like, I've been looking at the big picture for so long that I'm forgetting some of the smaller details, and that's the people. And so, you know, Green Arrow kind of pulls him down to earth. Um, and at the same time, um, Hal is also learning from Green Arrow, um, you know, to, to care more about the people, and then Ollie is learning more from, from Hal about, you know, you have to do the right thing all the time. And I always thought that those two together, the way they clashed, they were best friends. They were absolutely solid best friends who probably were complete opposites philosophically before they started. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and it was great. It was great to, to have him put a final stamp on those two characters and also... Um, you know, just deliver a, a very memorable story. And, and, you know, obviously, rest in peace, Denny O'Neill. You will not be forgotten anytime soon because you are a legend. And I'm so glad that you got to play in the sandbox uh, one more time. Absolutely. And, and to have Adams back drawing it, too. Um, it, well, it was it was Mike Grell drew it. Oh, was it? Yeah. Why did I think Neil Adams? I don't oh, know. Wow, I sorry. mean, Neil Adams would have been great, but it is um, Mike Grell is credited as the artist of that storyline. Okay, uh, you know, I think he was kind of drawing it in the, the Adams style, he was. I think. That he, might be it. You're right, he was. No, he definitely was channeling some some Adams in there. Um, yeah, but uh, Grill is amazing, too, and he's fantastic. Oh, man, yeah, Longbow Hunters, love that story. Um, yeah. So the next story now, because now we're going through the generations of, uh, of Lanterns, um, you know, even though we got two Hal stories, uh, now it's time for us to go on to uh, Kyle Rayner. And Kyle Rayner has a story by 
Kyle Rayner writer Ron Mars and artist yeah. Daryl Banks. So I thought that was cool they got Ron Mars back. And I thought this was like a fun little story. I don't have much to say about it, so I'm going to kind of let you take the, the lead on it from what you remember, and I'll just interject from time to time. Sure. And if I do remember, Daryl Banks was the original artist on Green Lantern with Ron Mars. I think when, some, when, um, some of the issues, because that actually, he went through a lot of artists on that run, because he was on that book for yes. a long time. Yeah. But I think initially, and in fact, I think that um, Mars and... Um, and, and the artists are given credit for the creation of, of the kid. Um, I'm pretty sure. I, I'd have to go back and look, but I'm pretty sure it was Banks and, and him. But uh, it's a great story. It, it they definitely takes place during a certain period of time, too, where, where Kyle was... It's more recent, but they mentioned that there was a period of time where Kyle was the only Green Lantern. Um, you know, he's talking to a gentleman who is kind of... It has a storage bin with a bunch of Guy Gardner stuff in it. And... Um, as they're talking, um, he says, you know, I, I, there was a time where there were a bunch of Green Lanterns, but then for a long time there was only you, you know, and, and what was that like? And, he, you know, he talks about it a little bit, and I always thought it was neat um, that this character was created with almost no knowledge of what the core was or what it stood for, and he kind of had to blaze his own path for a little bit before he learned of the, the deep, rich history of the Green Lanterns. And uh, in this particular story, he's picking up some stuff, that belongs to Guy Gardner. Because Guy Gardner is off in space, you know, with the core now. And he wants to take some of the Warriors' um, memorabilia and bring it back to Guy to set up on Ella. Right, yeah. Guy has, you know, his Earth Warriors bar was destroyed. So this is during the time where he was building the one up in space. So Kyle is wearing one of his older outfits um, in this storyline. But it's still, you know, at a time where the other members have come back. Um, right. So it's it's kind of cool. It's a nice nod to the the you know the '90s stuff that Ron Mars did, but then also like a, a, a pretty good probably precursor or something that takes place adjacent to uh, Green Lantern Rebirth or something like that back when that came out. Um, yeah. Also, a very very neat touch is that Guy Gardner is not in this story, but he's very much a part of it. Um, like at one point they're 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 going through the different boxes and um, one of them unearths this thing. And what it turns out to be is, is it turns into a giant robot that starts, like, blowing stuff up. Um, and then the, the old man's like, who would store something like this? And, and Kyle's just like, well, well Guy Gardner would. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's such a great character second. And guy, Guy's not even there. But you're like, yeah, that's, that's totally something Guy would do. You know, he's not there. But what I really liked that Kyle did was... Um was that when this giant robot shows up that, you know, was deactivated, but then reactivates when Kyle is in its presence, um, Kyle has to defeat it. And what he does is he creates out of his ring with the constructs, he creates the other green lanterns. So he creates yes. Guy Gardner, Jessica Cruz, uh, Simon Baz, um, you know, which is, is funny. Cause I'm like, I don't know why he would be in this costume around the time Jessica and Baz were around. But well, he it, shouldn't be. He shouldn't. Yeah. He shouldn't be. But it's fine. It's like it doesn't really matter, um, ultimately, to the story. But I do. I, I did like that he created the other Green Lanterns to be the thing that destroys this robot. So again, yeah. him carrying that torch because that's that's who he is. He's called the torchbearer for a reason. And I've always liked the respect that writers give Kyle, even when they're like, "Hey, like when Hal came back, Jeff Johns like, all right, Hal's coming back, but um, we're st I'm still going to pay respect to Kyle because." Like you said, he came in and he had no real introduction to what the core was, and then soon after he became Green Lantern, the core and everybody get wiped out, and he yeah. had he had to police all thirty six hundred sectors all by himself, and which makes him arguably one of the greatest Green Lanterns of all time. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. And uh, there there was a, a fantastic uh, sequence in Green Lantern Rebirth where Sinestro is is beating up um, Kyle pretty good. And he's kind of talking about it. You know, you're a whelp. You're nothing. You're 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 nothing worth respecting. And that's when when Hal shows up and he smacks the crap out of Sinestro. He's like, no, you will respect him right. because he's the reason the core exists right now. And it was such a great moment because they were bringing Hal back to prominence, but they didn't want to take away what Kyle was. And I really like that. John did a great job with that. Yeah, he did. He did definitely did. And I felt like he was mirroring like the online conversations, which was like. How Jordan's coming back finally, the real Green Lantern comes back. And, you know, that's how fans talk sometimes. And I think this was his way of channeling, like, no, that's that's not how fans talk. Fans can all have their favorite Green Lantern 
and still have conversations. So he had the villain oh, yeah. of the story, he had the villain say, don't respect Kyle, and then he had the hero say, no, do respect Kyle. So I like that a lot. Well, yeah. Um, and, and I'm a huge Hal fan, and, and I don't think anyone was happier when he was coming back than me. But that didn't mean I didn't like Kyle. Absolutely, and and they and they went on to do some really great stuff with Kyle anyway. So, um, yeah. So then the next story we have after this is is probably more you and I speed because it's Kilowog and Guy Gardner. <laughs> uh, I um, guess this story was really really cool. Um, it's written by Pete Tomasi, and I think uh, Fernando Pazarin who did. Um, the uh, the book that you know after brightest day they launched a um, a core book that starred Guy Gardner and this was the team that made that book so it was cool to see them come back and tell a fun Guy Gardner Kilowog story so yeah walk us through that what happened in this story Gene uh, well first of all Tomasi is more and more becoming one of my favorite writers over at DC oh, yeah. um, he is my favorite writer at DC yeah there's there's very little heat wrong he's done in my life I didn't really dig that Green Lantern book when it was happening. Um, but I did come to appreciate it later after I read, went back and read them a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm kind of uh, experiencing a huge brain fart right now. So could you maybe walk me through this, this plot so I don't totally remember it right now? Yeah, and that's okay. Um, yeah, and for those who are listening, you know, like I have my copy in front of me, but Gene doesn't have his copy in front of him. So, you know, there's there, that's why we're kind of double teaming this and working together. Yeah. And, and I read it once, and I might have, from the stories that are from here on out, I'm not sure I paid total attention to it. I'll admit that right now. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, well, that's... I'll do my best to muddle through. <laughs> no, that's all right. We'll be, you will be here. And the more, I'm, I'm just excited to hear you talk Green Lantern. I mean, that's why I brought you wow. on here. Um, so in this storyline, we have, um, you know, it, it starts off with uh, Guy Gardner at, at a bar on Oa, and he's bragging about all these great things that he does, and he's like, he's the best at everything. And people, some people are, believe, some of the rookies are believing him and thinking he's cool, and some of the others are like, oh my God, here he goes again telling that story. He didn't even do that, but he's telling, you know. So it's kind of him uh-huh. just, just being Guy Gardner. Uh, but then he is summoned to get Kilowog and bring Kilowog out on a secret mission that they don't really know of what's happening yet. And it looks like it could be Kilowog's home planet being attacked. And so, so Guy Gardner's like, all right, all right, Kilowog, because Silak is there, and he's like, let's go, let's go save your home world. And then they kind of go on this journey through space, and they're, you know, talking to each other and connecting. But Kilowog's very silent and quiet, and you don't really know why. And then you find out uh, that uh, this day is very meaningful for him. And do you remember what today is in this story? If I remember right, wasn't it that either the day his planet was destroyed or his family died? It's not only both of those things, but it's also his birthday. Oh, that's right. And he, he, he hates his birthday because it lands on that day. Exactly. Now I remember. Now I, the story is coming back to me now. And one thing I'll mention as a sidebar, uh, Salak showing up excites me because he's a character I've loved. Since he first appeared in, um, I think it was, I think he, him and Kellogg might share a first appearance in Green Lantern Corps 201, um, yes. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And, and I always loved Salak, and one of the better things done with him is making him kind of the the uh, the pencil pusher of the Green Lantern Corps. <laughs> like he's the, he's the red tape, and no, nothing suits him better than that. Yeah, he's. I love that role for him too. And yes, he's amazing at it. <laughs> and I like how personally, t- like if a criminal gets out or a, or if a rule was broken, he takes full accountability for it too. He's a, he's a really good leader in that way. Um, yeah, he was fantastic. And- Again, I really enjoyed him because I really enjoyed that Green Lantern core book that Green Lantern became after issue 200. That was a fun book. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, so in this story here, we have Mogo, the planet, had um, used its ring to, you know, uh, to kind of change its e- everything down to its soil and the type of plant life that grew on it um, in order to look like his home world. And, uh, and they did this as a way to lure Kilowog back, and this was his birthday gift. It was like, hey, you get to spend a day on your old planet, you know, for one more, right. for one more day. And, um, and he does. He admits that he hates his birthday because of the day it lands on. But to see that everyone went so far out of their way to give him something truly special uh, and to include Mogo in it, I thought it was really good. And so they end by saying, the, you know, the lantern um, oath – and uh, and they all you know and Kilowog kind of has a tear run down his eye and he's like this was really special and I I'm glad to have a new family with you guys so yeah I thought right. it was really really well done 
there's an interesting little tidbit. When uh, Kilowog first showed up in Greenlander Core, the 201, there's an interesting like tragedy to his life. Um, he was at the dawn of time with the other heroes during Crisis. So he's a, he remembers a pre-Crisis world. Right. At, at least initially. Yeah. And what his, what his tragedy is, is his planet didn't so much get destroyed as now in this new crisis, post-crisis era, it never existed. Yeah. Everyone he's ever known, everyone he's ever loved, they just didn't exist. Right. Yeah, that's a uh, it's yeah. So he's he's kind of a guy. He's like um, Bishop in Age of Apocalypse, where he remembers both timelines, um, or yes. or Flash and Flashpoint. He remembered both timelines. Um, yeah, seemed only for a little while though. Yeah, I'm sure that muddies the continuity. So they probably ignored that after a while. But um, but yeah, this was still a good story. Heart of the Core by Pete Tomasi and Fernando Passerin. But the next one I actually really dug because it kind of harkens back to the animated universe. And it also focuses on my favorite Green Lantern, uh, which is of Earth anyway. Uh, not my favorite Green Lantern in total, but uh, my favorite yep. Green Lantern of Earth, which is, uh, with his, uh, which is John Stewart. So um, this story was written by Charlotte Fullerton, who is also Charlotte McDuffie, who I believe is the spouse uh, of uh, or the wife, the former wife of Dwayne McDuffie. Um, right. and, uh, and with artist Criss Cross, they tell the story called Reverse the Polarity, um, which is pretty fun. Do you, do you remember some of the beats of this storyline? A little bit, but you might, you might want to start because I'm probably forgetting some of it. Yeah, I mean, basically what this story is, is like I said, it, it kind of, Dwayne McDuffie, who was a fantastic person, I got to meet him numerous times. He used to shop at Golden Apple Comics uh, when I worked there in L.A., and he's cre- you know one of the creators of the Milestone Universe, um, also worked on the Just League cartoons, uh, wrote Just League comic books for a while after Brad Meltzer was on the book, and he was, I think, very much responsible, or part of it responsible for the Hawk Girl and uh, Jon Stewart relationship that spawned from the show, and even brought some of that in the comics when he was writing Justice League. So it seems Charlotte decided to take the reins on that and continue that and have Jon Stewart and tell a story with Jon Stewart and Shiera Hall on the Watchtower fighting Dr. Polaris. Yes, and it's pretty fantastic because it could very well, I mean, minus the art style, fit into an episode of Justice League, the cartoon. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, yeah. If someone told me that this was a, like a, a side story or an unused script or something, I would totally accept it as that and be like, this is great. But even as main continuity, I still don't mind it either. No, me either. I, I like that. I, I like the pairing of, um, of John and, and Shayra. I think it, it's interesting. It's different than what's come before. Absolutely. Yeah. And in the Batman beyond universe, they have a kid together. So they, you know, they got to hook up. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, um, so yeah, so Dr. Pillars basically finds a way to teleport onto the, the ship, you know, onto the watchtower. He finds some, you know, MacGuffin device. It's called like the Melistonium or something like that. And uh, and he uses it to increase his power to fight back against Shiera and John. And of course, they team up and they come up with a strategy to fight him. It doesn't work the first time. But then after uh, John uses his ring to uh, send a beam around behind Polaris and take the Melistonium from him, now he's back to regular power, and they're able to recreate their plan of attacking high and low, but they switch positions. Uh, but then John takes the power onto himself, and Shaira's voice is what brings John back to sanity when to save him at the end of the story. Yes, and I always like when they use Dr. Polaris. He's one of those villains that a lot of people are like, that's a dopey-looking dude. <laughs> but um, he basically has the powers that Magneto has. He's much more powerful than he's really given credit for he looks like Magnet Man from Mega Man, which is awesome. Uh, he has a, v- a very similar helmet to Magnet Man. Um, so uh, I love that about him because uh, I'm a big Mega Man fan. But, yeah, he is goofy looking. But I, I don't know. I'm, I'm with you. I like the use of him, and I like the use of him here. And I like that at the end of the story it even says that it's dedicated to the memory of Dwayne, which is fantastic. Yeah, which is great. Bring, bring in someone who can't be a part of it but is a part of the mythology so much. Agreed. Um, so yeah, that was my favorite Earth Green Lantern, John Stewart. I'll talk about my final, my favorite Green Lantern of all time. We'll talk about it at the end of the episode. But uh, the next storyline we'll kind of go through briefly too. Um, it's a really great um, emotional storyline. Uh, well, you don't realize it's emotional until the, the last page. Um, but it's a storyline called Four, and it's basically it's written by Rob Robert Vendetti, who took over Green Lantern comics after Jeff Johns, who I thought did a, actually a pretty good job on on the run. And then uh, Rafael Sandoval did the artwork on this. And it basically follows um, 
you know, an older Kyle Rayner, Hal Jordan, and John Stewart at a bar called Hunter's Green, and it's the three of them sitting around drinking and toasting someone who's not there, and they, you don't you don't know why Guy Gardner is that not there, but they reveal that as the story goes, and and you know, I was kind of wondering seeing a story take place in the fu- a potential future and a look back at all their great adventures together, what was kind of your takeaway or favorite moments in this story? Oh, man. I, you know, every moment where those four are part of the story together, it always excites me because I think that that's like a, no, no pun intended, the core group. Those are the four guys that really, you know, they're to me, they're the Green Lanterns. Um, yeah. You know, above, above and beyond anyone else who's created after that. And um, it's terrific just to see their banter and, you know, the, the little mystery of what's going on with Guy. It, it, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it was really good. They're sitting around and they have this this thing where they say, four legs on a table, four walls on a house, four seats in a Mustang GT. And then they all toast each other. And it's because it's, you know, the four of them. They're the four horsemen, the four original Earth Green Lanterns and everything. So this is them acknowledging that they're the four, you know, originals, minus obviously Alan Scott, of course. Um, but he's a different kind of Green Lantern. So, um, so yeah, it was neat. Then they reminisce on battles with Evil Star, and they talk about Guy Gardner and how my favorite line in this, which is, you know, Guy Gardner was always the first one into a battle, whether it was against Sinestro or whatever. They even re- reminisce on a story where Guy Gardner goes to fight Sinestro, and he just shows up butt naked. Um, and, it, and it distracts Sinestro long enough uh, to where Sinestro is like, what is this? And so he starts beating up Guy, who's standing there naked, and the other Green Lanterns are able to come up and get the jump on Sinestro and beat him. And it's basically them saying, you know, uh, got, got, and he, I love the line. He goes, long time no peaky, Cindy. And he used to, like, sure. guy, guy, guy Gardner would call Sinestro Cindy. And I love that because they said, there's this great line, they said, um, you know, nobody took a punch like Guy Gardner. And they're like, yeah, and you know what? Uh, John Stewart said, it wasn't because Guy Gardner liked to be hit, and it wasn't because he had something to prove. He said Guy Gardner liked to walk into every room uh, and pick a fight because he begged to get punched in the face because the more he got punched, the less his friends got punched. Yes. And when they said that, I was like, man, if that doesn't sum up Guy Gardner so perfectly. Oh, absolutely. And there's so many moments where... Guy Gardner's will is expressed through stubbornness, and just just he will not give up no matter what. Uh, a great example of that we we talked about this on another one of your show recently is the Doomsday fight. Yes, where the, he couldn't even see. Yeah, and he was asking. Um, he was asking uh, what's her name? Um, oh, geez, what's her name? Frost? No, not Frost. Um, Maxima. Ice. Ice. Yeah. Ice. ice yeah. He was asking ice. He said, "Just just point my ring in the right direction." Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, it. To the end, he, he would always be that guy. He will go down fighting when he goes down. Well, that's the thing, and that's what they say in this. They're like, how did the guy go down? They're like, well, how do you think? <laughs> he went yeah. He went down swinging, man. Um, yeah. And what I love is that, that revelation at the end where uh, Kyle, they talk about this is the 17th year in a row that they've met up like this, um, but only it's only been a couple years since Guy passed. And they said, yeah, four rings, you know, four legs on a table. And then uh, Kyle looks under the table and looks back up. And he goes, guys, I've never noticed this before. And they're like, what? And he goes, this table doesn't have four legs. It actually just has one beam in the middle. And so they all have like a good laugh. And they're like, oh, okay. So our, our little uh, message that we say every year when we come here, there's actually not four legs on this table. <laughs> uh, and I like that Kyle notices that because as we know, and we talked earlier, Kyle was the lone Green Lantern for a while. Um, so it's funny that he would notice the lone pole that was holding up the table. Uh, but yeah, we get the moment at the end where we find out that they all go to Guy Gardner's grave in his tombstone, which says Guy Gardner, hero, lantern, friend. And, um, and he, they say they're the four cores men and they all hold up their hands, which no longer have rings because they're all old men. And they salute to Guy Gardner, which was amazing. Yeah. yeah it's a really good story about their friendship. I liked, um, in, in rebirth, there was a, a neat thing like that, very in the very beginning of the first issue, I think, where they're all meeting at a ball game. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. And even Hal is there, although he's not alive, he's still the specter at that point in time. Yes, that's true. Yep. Yeah, it was great. Every time those four get together, it's fantastic. I would fully support a book that was about those four guys teaming up every month. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I, I although I like what Grant Morrison's doing and trying new things with Green Lantern, it is just a Hal Jordan story, and I would much rather 
have more of the other characters, but they're all kind of divided up across the DC universe right now. But I would like that synergy. After they finish Death Metal, they need to get back to, you know, bringing in like the core and stop keeping them all so separate. Yeah, Morrison was really good at, at taking a breather because with 10 years of Jeff Johns or however long he was on that book, it was always epic. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. there wasn't a whole lot of time to slow down and say, all right, let's just do a fun story here. Uh, it was all epic. It was all crazy. So Morrison kind of, he, he was like a palate cleanser a little bit. So I, I kind of enjoyed that, but I am ready for more stuff with some of these other lanterns, specifically Guy, who hasn't been showing up enough. I agree. Yeah, Guy and Kyle haven't been doing too much. Um but we do get um, two other Green Lanterns that have been popping up, newer ones. So we're going to talk about them real quick in these last two stories. Uh, first up, we have The Voice, which is written by Mariko Tamaki and um, art by Mirka Andolfo. And this is a story that focuses on Jessica Cruz and kind of her anxiety and um, this fear she has of knives and how, you know, how dangerous she feels holding one and stuff and working through that fear of, of, you know, holding a knife and possibly hurting herself uh, because obviously she suffers from mental health issues and I think that's one of my favorite things about the character is that they're dress, addressing someone who's um, pa- panic uh, attack prone and has anxiety and worries a lot and, um, and looks too much into situations so she doesn't trust herself in situations where she might hurt herself. And so I like that they start with that and then it bleeds into a story where she teams up with Simon Baz and they're like buddy cops and in the first half of the story they fight an alien and she's not much help because she's still trying to learn how to be a Green Lantern and then it cuts and then you know Simon Baz has to save the day and then the last half of the story where she does break out of her shell finally deals with the fear she has of knives and uses her ring to create a knife to stab King Shark in the shoulder and save uh, Simon Baz's life at the end. So I, I kind of like that. And he says, wow, he's like, uh, you've come a long way, Cruz. So I I don't know. I like, first of all, I love the art in the story, but I, I actually liked this little buddy cop story. And I, I didn't know if you, because like I know you, you, towards the end of the book, you only read these stories once, but I kind of know what your thoughts were on that. Um, here's the thing. When Simon Baz was first introduced, it was, to me, it was like, this is gimmicky as all hell, because he's got a gun. You know, initially he had this gun that he carried around, and I hated that so much. Yeah. Like, you get the most powerful weapon in the universe, and you get, like, a toothpick. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, I, I grew to like him a little bit, although he's never been my favorite. But Jessica, I picked up on right away. Because, again, you know, she does share some of the same problems I have with anxiety. And being a Green Lantern, being part of this huge core, and, and basically, you know, at, at points, being afraid to leave your house. Um, yes, and yeah. having to be part of that greater, bigger thing, um, she's absolutely the, the character that most embodies overcoming fear to become what a Green Lantern should be. And I like her because of that. Yeah, for the past 10 years and you for the past few years, uh, post-aneurysm, from, you know, it's, it is a chore and it's full of unbelievable obstacles that you could never explain to people um, just to leave the house. Which is right, and do simple things. And do simple things, like get groceries or go to a job, sometimes even getting a job. Um, it's uh, such a series of hurdles to get over. And I think that's why, like you, I gravitated to Jessica immediately because I was like, wow, I didn't think I would connect on this kind of level with a comic book character. And when they did that with Jessica, I thought was great. And if you're, if you're out there and you haven't read a lot of Jessica Cruz storylines, I would at least recommend watching the Justice League versus the Fatal Five animated movie because yes. Jessica and Starman, who also suffers from mental health issues, they both um, carry that story in a wonderful way. And they made me love that character even more. It was kind of like how Into the Spider-Verse made me like Miles Morales a lot more. That, yes. an, that animated movie made me love Jessica Cruz like 10 times more. Yeah, and, and like we said, she really is. She's uh, clearly written by someone that knows what anxiety is too. Um, yeah, at least it, at least in this story, I don't know much about Mariko Tamaki. I hear her mentioned from time to time. I know some people out there aren't a fan of her writing, but I gotta say, I mean, this is one of my first experiences to her writing. This little short story, I thought, was done pretty well. Yeah, she knows what she's talking about with anxiety, or at least she researched it, if not experienced it herself. Because, yeah, it, it, it's something we got into a few minutes ago, but there's a weird crippling feeling you get, and you don't always necessarily know when it's going to happen. Um, here, here's just a good example from my life. Um, I had to send out some forms to my doctor um, for, you know, disability, that whole thing. But um, 
there was something that wasn't letting me fill those out. I was frozen for like two weeks and I could not fill out those forms. I actually had to ask for outside help. I'm like, I can't do it. And you know, that that's really captured in this, in this portrayal of Jessica. Yeah, I agree. I, there was a time uh, to share a personal story too. Remember in my first apartment, I lived in out here, I lived two blocks from a post office mm-hmm. and there were times where, unless I was on the phone with you, I wouldn't even walk down to the post office. Yeah. You, yeah. Remember, I would call you and be like, hey, man, I need to take a walk. Will you be on the phone with me? And you're like, sure. And if it wasn't for the sound, the comforting sound of a friend's voice, I couldn't even get to the post office to mail out a stack of Kickstarter books. Mm-hmm. And it was not even a block away from me. It was that close to me. Um, yeah. You know, walk, it, walk in Echo. I have to be on the phone when I walk Echo a lot of times. Yeah, anxiety hits it when you least expect it to. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Um, so then brings us to the last story, which is purely a Simon Bad story. It's written by Cena Grace, uh, art by Raymond Villalobos, and um, and it's called Homegrown Hero. And it's essentially a story where I got to say, at the, at the beginning, I didn't like it. it. It it has Simon show up and he's seeing his family. He's in Green Lantern gear. They all know he's Green Lantern, so that I don't mind. He's cool, but he's got like bloody guts of an alien on his shoulder and he's like casually talking to his family and flicking the guts off and nobody has a nasty reaction to it and i'm just yeah yeah I'm, so already i felt the tone was all over the place because i'm like is this supposed to be comical and if so why isn't anyone reacting because you need a reaction to sell the comedy so i immediately was confused by the tone of this story um, yeah i mean yeah I, I, yeah, I, I don't know what more to say about this story. I'll be honest with you. Baz, to me, only works when he's with Jessica. I know, I forget what book it was, but someone made them a tag team for a while in a book. Yeah, in, Rebir- and, uh, in Rebirth, it was called Green Lanterns. That's right, okay. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I enjoyed that, but Baz on his own never really appeals to me. Yeah, because Baz is great. Like, when you do a buddy cop thing, you want the straight man, or the you know, like, do you want the, the person who won't make jokes? And then you want someone like um, unpredictable, whether they make jokes or not, you want the opposite. So you have, you know, Simon, who's this great extrovert guy who's a a former soldier, you know, um, he's Middle Eastern. um, And he, yeah, he carries his gun because he likes to say, well, eventually, sometimes this Green Lantern ring might run out of juice and I want to have something to protect me, you know, because I'm a soldier and it it just feels good to have, to make sure I I have a backup. And it's like, okay, you can kind of understand his mentality, even though most things he goes up against, a gun isn't going to work against anyway. Um, But when you put that mentality with someone like Jessica Cruz, they do make a very interesting dynamic. So I agree with you. Here, this is a solo story with him. And yeah, I mean, like, I understand the character. I understand he's Middle Eastern. I understand the, uh, the, you know, the the kind of the social uh, things that... Middle Easterns in America go through sometimes, especially after events like 9-11 or other things like that, where there are any kind of attacks, you know, or anything, or if we're at war with somebody. Um, I, I understand the tension that grows. So it's, it's not, I'm not against them dealing with those issues in a character, but when I was reading this, I felt like, I don't know, like Cena Grace is a very nice guy. I've met him numerous times, but I don't, I don't really like him as a writer a lot of times. Like on his stuff, like Little Depressed Boy, I think he's effective on that because he loves and, and you know clearly has a connection to that character. But whenever he writes mainstream characters like X Men or Simon and stuff, and he, he deals with these social issues, I don't feel like he handles it in a very strong way. And in this one, it's basically Simon spotting a guy in a crowd who's going to be an active shooter. And, you know, and he's going to shoot into the public with a machine gun. Now, granted, again, I agree that that is a story that can be told and should be told, and it reflects, you know, modern day stuff. But I just feel like the execution of it here in this story with Simon, it didn't, I don't know, it just didn't work for me. Yeah, he, he writes with heart, but it's not necessarily always, like, placed in the right place. Um, it, it's almost like he wants to write characters that he created and so he takes characters that already exist and he, he molds them to what he wants to do with them and that doesn't necessarily work all the time right right. And, like you said he's a great guy and I'm sure he is and you know he's been lucky enough to write some great things but um, yeah he doesn't. He always hit and mess with me yeah that's how I feel about him so that's how I feel about this story I was like well they you know, they definitely saved the and it's, it's a bummer because I, you know, we, this book is like it knocks it out of the park. I would say as a rating for this book, it would get a nine out of 10. It would, and only because nine of the stories I think are very good. And that 10th one, I'm kind of 
meh on. And it's a bummer that it's I feel meh on it because it is Simon Baz, who, like you and I, I agree with you, he's a neat character, but he only works well with, uh, with Jessica. So it's like, all right, here's a chance to tell a good solo story with him. And I feel like they didn't pick a writer that could have really do- dove into a, a good solo Simon Baz story. So it didn't turn me around on the idea of wanting more Simon Baz solo stories. Right. Um, I think that, that the strength in all the Baz stories has been he's primarily on Earth uh, because right. that's the kind of Green Lantern he is. And, you know, we weren't getting a lot of Green Lanterns on Earth at the time that his stories were coming out. Right. Um, which, I, which, I mean, I, oh. Yeah, which is why I gravitated to him at first, too, because I'm like, oh, good, finally we get Earth Green Lantern stories again. Right. Um, but I would love to see them take him outside of his box and have him in the, the larger universe of Green Lanterns for a bit. Yeah, I would too. Um, I would too. And and to me, we already have John Stewart, who's kind of the stoic military guy. So I wouldn't mind Simon having a little sense of humor, you know, too. Um, it's yeah. Like, or start to develop one, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you. Um, so then also, you know, that kind of completes the stories in this book. But the one thing this book also does, which I really love, something you and I love, they put up pinups throughout this book of other Green Lanterns, some who show up in the book, some who don't. So we have like Joe Moline, who is from the new Far Sector book. Uh, so we have like a pinup by that character. Have you read Far Sector yet? I have not. I really want to. Yeah, I read the first issue. It's okay. I mean, it's very um, world building and exposition-y, but um, it's kind of neat. It's like a human-ish Green Lantern on a planet that has never had violence in like 500 years. And right. and then she arrives there to kind of keep an eye on things just because it's her sector and it's like the only living planet in her sector. And then the first murder in 500 years happens and it's like, oh wow. So is it is it a coincidence that a Green Lantern is assigned there a month before the first murder or is it something that's being planned? So it's, right. it's it's kind of a neat mystery. So I kind of like it. We also get pinups of How Jordan by Bruce Tim and Raphael Grandpa. We got a Jessica Cruz pinup by Joelle Jones. Uh, Jamal Campbell's the one who does the Joe Moline uh, pinup. We have um, a Kelly Quinn, which is known as the Teen Lantern from the current uh, Young Justice story arc. So we have a David LaFuente uh, drawing of, of Teen Lantern, who I know nothing about other than uh, it's Brian Michael Bendis, and I think it's a young girl who hacks into... Owen technology and hacks and creates her own Green Lantern power. Um, that seems yeah. that seems very typical of Bendis. It's like he created Riri Williams, and it's like, hey, let's just create a character who hacks into Tony Stark's you know business and and creates her own Iron Man armor and steals everything. And so that's what this character c- screams as. And I'm like, I, Bendis is a good. He's after M- Miles, who I feel like earned the title of Spider Man. I feel like every character he created after Miles was someone who didn't earn jack shit, in my opinion. Well, yeah, Teen Lantern is very strange because they say she hacked a ring. Uh, <laughs> now, right? The, the I, ring's I don't know not how a, you do something like that. The the ring's not a computer that you can hack a hack with with a human laptop. Right. My my thought on that, if you really wanted to, to make it work and they really explore her story, which Ben this hasn't really done, there's like, yeah, she hacked the ring. That's it. And then I just don't explain it after that. But um, right. one one uh, person did have something that was able to absorb Green Lantern power, and that was, I think, Black Hands had a little staff that did that. So maybe you could somehow make it work with that, but it's pretty dumb as a whole. It's true. Um, the next one's a little controversial for me, too, because uh, they uh, it's Ty Pham, who is from the uh, recent uh, book Green Lantern Legacy, and it's an Asian uh, Green Lantern, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that, obviously. My problem was is when it came out, the writer and everyone on the book and the editors in DC were touting it as the first Asian Green Lantern. Um, yeah. And that really upset me because, I, like I said, I'm a big Batman Beyond fan, and we had a Asian Green Lantern in Batman Beyond. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, the little kid, right? He was, a, he was a kid monk from Nanda Parbat. Yeah, I liked him. Yeah, and so I was really upset by that. Um, I was like, come on, guys, know your own continuity. I, I mean, I understand that that character is not in main continuity, but neither is this character. So Yeah, you know, in case higher-ups at DC are listening to this show, which of course they are, um, <laughs> here's what you got to do. Get some money, put it aside, you know, the money that you're spending on contract with people that don't deserve it. You hire Mark Wade, not so much as a writer, as your continuity guy. 
because there's not too many people that know more about DC continuity than Wade at this point that's alive. So you bring him in, his job is to make sure that all the stuff fits. And that's his job. Just do that, DC, right? Or alternatively, hire me. I was going to say, hire Gene. I'm not for the Mark Wade hiring. Um, <laughs> uh, but then there's also a Kyle Rayner pinup and a Guy Gardner pinup. And then in the back of the book, there's a secret files that lists a ton of Green Lanterns, humans and non, um, all that make at least brief appearances in this book. Uh, so we have like Salak and, uh, you know, um, Hanu and Shorm, Larvax, I think, um, uh, what's, what's the, Nort? Is that, yeah, Nort. Um, yeah. Yeah, Vaz. You know, there's there's a bunch of uh, characters in the back. 2-6 and Rot- Rotlop Fan is in here. So, um, yeah, I thought this was cool. I mean, is there any Green Lanterns that you're a big fan of that aren't the ones we mentioned? And are there any Green Lanterns you would have liked to seen um, a short story on in this book? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and then one character that you mentioned earlier was your favorite that you wanted to bring up at some point. And I'm going to tell you who that is, guys. It's Chip. Uh, Chip <laughs> doesn't show up anywhere in this book. <laughs> Chip got renamed to Bedug or something. Uh, yeah, there was a second Chip. Because um, <laughs> the original Chip, unfortunately, got ran over by a truck. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's how he died. He got hit by a truck. <laughs> yeah. And then he came around with But uh, actually, I, I, I did kind of have a thing for Chip. I kind of liked him because he's a cute character. I would love to have seen Arisa. Um, a little bit because I, I do like her you know minus the creepiness of her aging herself and sleeping with Al but I like sure. the young Aretha and I also liked um, John Stewart's wife Kat Matui yes. I liked her a lot as a Green Lantern yeah I'm a big fan of Kat Matui also um, I'll be honest with you because I'm a bigger Justice League Unlimited fan I'm, I actually like the Shiera Hall relationship with John um, mm-hmm. but I do I'm a big fan of Kat Matui for sure um yeah, my favorite Green Lantern. So, like I said, my favorite human Green Lantern is John Stewart. Uh, that was just the first comic I read with Green Lantern. John Stewart was the Green Lantern, just like my first Iron Man comic was Rhodey as Iron Man. Um, so, yes. so those became my favorite versions of those characters. So, I actually don't like Tony Stark. I'm a War Machine guy, um, and I'm a John Stewart guy. But uh, as far as Green Lantern go, my favorite Green Lantern is Abin Sur, and it's a bummer because yes. every time we get an Abin Sur story, in most cases. It's just the, his death. That's the story we get. And that's what I liked about Jeff Johns. He went back and added that Abin Sir created the um, Compassion Corps, um, yeah. and, you know, of all those characters. And that um, also, when I was younger and getting into DC Comics in the early 90s, when I was reading more and more DC, um, I used to read a book called, uh, I think it was called Showcase, um, and DC Legends. That was another one. And these are really... Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, and these were really great uh, single books that had uh, stories in them that they would change. They were anthology books, and there was a great uh, series uh, that focused on Abin Sur in the Wild West where he fought an alien named Traitor, and he came to Earth in the Wild West times, and he was protecting Earth as a Green Lantern then. So, yeah, I remember that story. It, it rings in my head, and I would have loved to have an Abin Sur Wild West story in this book. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great, yeah. Um, that the, the full title of that anthology book, by the way, was Legends of the DC Universe. Yeah, that's it. And um, if you are any kind of DC fan, you owe it to yourself to track down these issues or if they ever made a trade. Uh, because it'd be like a three-part, like, um, Martian Manager story, then an Abin Sir story. Mm-hmm. Then you'd get you just, just all, all these off-the-wall things that you wouldn't expect to see. And you never knew what you were getting issue by issue. And it's... Every story in there was really solid. I love that book. So for those wondering, you the entire series is available on Comixology. Um, ah. So you can buy any issues you want on Comixology. And there's um, the two-part Abin Sur story is like around issues 20 or 21, somewhere in there. Uh, and then like around issues 50 or 60, uh, that same writer and team, I think it was the same artist and writer, came back and told a sequel to that story where Hal Jordan had to face Traitor. Um, and then another 40 issues later came back and told a story where Kyle Rayner had to face Traitor. So it was, nice. it was called the Traitor Trilogy, and you can find it in a, a, a long out-of-print trade paperback you can probably find it on eBay. Um, but it was, it's called Green Lantern Traitor, and uh, it's spelled like the word traitor, like if you betray somebody. And he's, right. he visited Earth three times, and each time he visited, he fought a different Green Lantern. He went from Abin Sir to Hal to Kyle. And it's really, really great. And what's cool is that the ring itself is almost like a character in those stories. And the ring 
uh, tells Kyle about the previous times Trader came and also reports the closure of the case when Kyle Rayner finally defeats Trader, reports the closure of the case to the Guardians on Oa. Right, right. So uh, I wouldn't have minded seeing a Guardian story. Yeah, for sure. That would have been good. That would have been nice. They've been kind of out of play for a little while. Um, I'd yeah. like to see a little more with them, uh, specifically some of the the different uh, lantern or different guardians that were don't just look like all the others. Like what's his face? Um, um, blanking Ali, on his name. Ali Ali Apsa. Yeah, yeah, I think that's his name. The one that was um, oh man, the one that aged and decided to just kind of like be different than the others. He well, was in, there's Ganthit. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ali Ali Apsa is just an, another. Uh, that's just me flexing my my knowledge. <laughs> uh, Ganthet, um if you're again a Green Lantern fan that hasn't maybe read everything, uh, look in the comicology and see if you can find Ganthet's Tale, which was an actual Green Lantern uh, one shot prestige format book written and drawn by John Byrne years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. There's um, and then through the Green Lantern, John, uh, J- Jeff Johns run, there was Saad, um, and there was also uh, Scar. Uh, she became an evil, mm-hmm. evil Lantern. Obviously, there's Krona, um, who kind of started it all. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, that would have been fun to explore the Guardians in a book. But I understand it's called Green Lantern, and they wanted to focus on all the main characters that had their own books throughout the history, which is totally fine. Um, but uh, we are going to get more Green Lantern stuff this year. Earlier, Gene and I were talking off screen or off recording about a, an X Men series of uh, hard covers that they put out and then also the um the crisis uh, series and you know, they're putting it out in like 12 hard covers well this year we're also getting the 10th anniversary of blackest night and brightest day and they're reprinting all of that in chronological order in like 13 hard covers and they're putting them all in one big box set for 300 dollars. man yeah. i saw the crisis box set which is like it's like eight new trades and six previously published trades all in hardcover mm-hmm. and uh, I'll tell you if any of you out there I, I know you, there's some big fans out there of, of me because I'm awesome uh, if you want to pick up that book for me um, <laughs> Seek will give you something on my show I don't know what but just buy me that and Seek will take care of you <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah buy my friend Gene something for $300 and I'll, I'll figure out something to do $332 on Amazon to be <laughs> okay. exact Okay, it's fine. I feel like you should come up with the other three, the other thirty-two dollars, if you really want it that badly. Well, I suppose if someone comes up with the three hundred, I'll, I'll support the other thirty-two. But <laughs> yeah, you're a true, you're a true fan. You won't make me go through that. <laughs> you'll meet them halfway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nine um, tenths of the way. Gene, um, I know this is a long episode. I, I I don't typically do episodes that are more than an hour, but. I, I just knew me and you were going to have a lot to say about this. I couldn't think of a better way to celebrate Green Lantern's 80th anniversary, and I couldn't think of a better person to talk to during it other than my friend who was one of the first friends I ever made that I connected to over Green Lantern. So, you know, any final thoughts on either this book or last statements on Green Lantern in general? I think it's a, he's such a, a terrific character and such a terrific concept. Um, I've been a Green Lantern fan from, you know, from when I was very, very young, like I said. Um, and I went back and I read most of the Silver Age stuff, and there's just something about the character of Hal Jordan and then expanding into the core that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, I remember the first issue I read where Hal met John Stewart, which I think was Green Lantern Volume 1, Number 42, which I think may be the first mention of Earth 2 by name, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But um, it, it's things like that. Um, where it makes Hal stand out even more to me. And I know this is about all the Green Lanterns, but to me, Hal was the one that I, I read for so long. And yeah, I, I did come along and I did read all the John Stewart stuff from like 170 to 200. Um, and I love that stuff too. John, John is an amazing character. And then, you know, guy coming back around issue 194. It's just, it was just this ever building universe within the DC universe. And I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I like the concept of a superhero that is essentially also a space cop. Um, I like that these space cops have their own beats to walk like a regular cop would, so they have a sector that they have to protect. I like the structure and the organization. Normally when you deal with superheroes, um, you know, you deal with, they're, they're, it's kind of like whatever. Like Batman has a code and he has a strategy of things, but he's just kind of going out randomly at night doing things and catching bad guys, and that's the, the case for most superheroes. 
with Green Lantern, there's a structure there. There's there's a, a like a p police precinct, that, you know, the Guardians on Oa. Uh, there's the sector, so everybody has to go to their sector and protect and walk their beat. Um, they some now are given a partner to work on their beat with, um, except for Earth, which is apparently so screwed up. It's one of the worst districts in the universe because it has to have like seven Green Lanterns protect it. Um, but uh, but that's what I like about it because I grew up in a life of structure. I grew up on Air Force bases, so. Even though I first got in with John Stewart and he was a Marine, um, but I grew up in a military family. So when I started to discover Hal Jordan and realized he wanted to be a pilot uh, when he was a kid, much like I wanted to be a pilot when I was a kid, and I grew up watching airplanes take off and the the angels and you know and all these uh, different uh, great air shows that they do. Um, I grew up and moved around Air Force Base to Air Force Base, and I grew up around planes. And so this was a character that I liked, and then also you know even though I don't you know like my father he was in the air force and he was a cop but i've always liked the concept of because i grew up in a military life the concept of cops and uh, people in uniform and soldiers and i liked that that was represented in comic book form by a guy like hal jordan who john was great because he was very stoic and he was very professional he reminded me a lot of optimus prime and that's why i like john stewart a lot he was a natural born leader um, Hal Jordan, what I like about Hal Jordan is that he is like the heroes that I saw in movies growing up. He is like, um, he, you know, he's like all the Harrison Ford characters, you know, he's Indiana Jones. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's Han Solo. Uh, he's these, he's these cocky a-holes that you just kind of, you're glad he's on your side, even though you don't get along with him. Um, and that's, yeah. and, and that led me to Guy and Kyle and now Jessica and Baz and, and the universe of Green Lanterns and Kilowog and Abin Sir. And it's just been a fun universe to be a part of. And, you know, I can say without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, Green Lantern has always been my favorite DC comic character and universe and part of the DC universe. And I'm so glad that we're celebrating here together, um, you know, 10 years after my aneurysm, a few years past yours, still alive and still holding the torch and, uh, and being Green Lantern fans. Absolutely, and, and in fact, uh, we're, re we're recording this. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but um, we are recording this on Monday, June 29th. One day ago was the um, fourth anniversary of my aneurysm. They, wow, look at that! Your anniversary. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I know I have my. I I kind of don't celebrate my anniversary anymore every year, but um, but then I, I say that. But then when it comes to my anniversary, if I have a few dollars in my account. I go buy myself something. <laughs> um, I, I got really morose and, and, and kind of pouted the whole day. That's why I celebrated it. That's I know it's it's tough because it's not a it's not a happy anniversary to have for sure. Um, but it's uh, but it is one that shows that we you know you and I have made it another year, and uh, and much like when these guys celebrated you know Guy Gardner, um, it's something you know, on some level me and you maybe every year should make a a deal to to reunite and do a Green Lantern podcast together. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Oh. Um, it, that would be amazing. I'd be down for that. But we have to bring back, if we're going to write Green Lanterns, I think we should write it too. <laughs> we got to bring back the Predator, which is a character that appeared around issue 180 of Green Lantern. There was a mystery about who he was. Uh, he was just this guy that was kid, like kind of clad in like silver and black. Right. And he'd show up with he had these claws. And the explanation for who he was turned out to be really freaking lame. But uh, we can just ignore that and make our own character with him. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna, you know, we'll come back next year and we'll we'll team up on writing the Killing Joke version of the Predator story. Oh boy, there you go. <laughs> um, well, Ed Gene, thank you so much for being here, talking with me for like an hour and twenty minutes about Green Lantern. It, it means the world, and uh, and obviously we'll do other things. We'll meet up. We'll talk throughout the year, but definitely around this time next year we should reunite and and do something else special for Green Lantern. Oh, Amen. All right, awesome. Um, and everyone else listening, thank you so much for sticking with us this whole time. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and uh, we'll have more uh, Beyond the Source Wall coming at you very, very soon. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace. <laughs>